Mm. That's what you have here. And then if you're uh, Johannes, you go at the end and then I'll put the OB people in the center. Thank you very much. Thanks so much. Yeah. Yeah. Ladies, ladies and gentlemen, you'll know that in organizing a conference, you need to work hard, but you also need to be lucky. And there are moments when in organizing things you just get lucky. And the thought of having the governor of the Bank of Brazil, uh, what is it, 72 hours or so after uh, <laughs> the Rosen election, uh, we feel very lucky, um, uh, uh, Governor Campos. Uh, and I suppose if you don't mind, let's get to the whole world in a moment, but why don't we just start with Brazil? Okay. Will you tell us a little bit about what the implications of the election result are, what, what meaning we should draw from it, and what the implications will be in the next 12 months to two years? Well, usually central banks uh, don't talk too much about uh, politics, but um, I think the implication is, um, as we can see, the country is very divided. Um, you have uh, you had an election in which um, I think the, some of the values that are attached to the current administra administration proved to uh, do very well in terms of electing people to uh, the lower house and the Senate. Um, you know, in the central bank, we you know we need to uh, we have we are independent now, so we have an autonomy. So our our main our main uh, function right now is to go on and carry on the plan. I think we have an important fight against inflation. Uh, we need to find a way for the country to grow uh, in, in a sustainable manner. I think the most important for uh, the things for us now is to continue with our agenda. We have a digital agenda that is promoting uh, inclusiveness in the, in the financial sector, is promoting competition in the banking system. Um, and you know, I will work with, uh, with the new government in the best way possible so that we can uh, achieve these things that I think uh, are going to be better uh, for, the, um, for the Brazilian population. Uh, and Governor, let's, let's turn to the inflation okay. question. Um, you probably can't say these things because they would be boastful and it would look bad amongst your former Santander colleagues, but the reality is, is that the things that you did last year to combat inflation at the time were perceived to be aggressive or by some even unnecessarily anxious. This year, we're looking at central banks saying overall they've done either too little too late, some say too much now. Mm -hmm. What is the outlook overall in terms of central banks and the management of inflation? Because I can't remember a time when it's become so divergent, and the implications of that are, of course, quite difficult. Well, before that, I need to say that I'm very happy to be here. <laughs> Santander. Santander was my home for 20 years, so I see a lot of, uh, uh, you, know, f you know, like family faces around here, so I'm very happy to be here. Um, so, and I'm glad you asked about inflation because it's something I'm more comfortable talking about <laughs> than, than politics. Um, I think the, 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 my answer is going to diminish a little bit the merit of your statement because I think that why did we do it before? Why did we do it the way we did it? Um, I think it has uh, two main components. One was that our interpretation of the global inflation process was a bit different. Maybe because you are a Brazilian and you have lived to high inflation for a long time. Um, when we started to see um, the huge coordination in terms of monetary and fiscal policy at the same time, in an unprecedented way in terms of the money being put to work, we're talking about nine trillion on an $80 trillion economy in a period of one year. So we started to think that you know, we need to watch to see um, what's going to be the monetary implication of that. And I think at that time, the world was caught in an argument that, you know, we don't have mobility, and because you don't have mobility, you have disruption in supply. And if you, don't ha if you have disruption, disruption in supply, and, and the mobility is causing you to consume more goods and less services, you're going to go back into an equilibrium, you know, very soon. And, you know, we thought, you know, no, we thought this was a bit different. Uh, what we saw happening was this huge amount of money being put to work with all the monetary stimulus was creating a dislocation in the demand. So you had more money, uh, people were at home, and they were consuming more goods, um, but the dislocation in the demand uh, was much stronger than the fact that we were having, uh, the, the dislocation in the demand for goods was much stronger than the fact that we're having in, the, in people consuming less services. And the problem is when you dislocate the demand for goods, and if you imagine a trend line in your head of goods and services today, 
globally, we still not back to the trend line. We had this huge shock in the consumption of goods, and you know we are barely going lower. If you look at the trend line for services, we had a drop, and now we are approaching the trend line again. So what is the meaning of that? I mean, if you have a you know a, a more permanent dislocation in the consumption for goods, you also have a more permanent dislocation in the demand for energy, because to produce goods takes much more energy than to produce services. So at that time, we we're beginning to see that you know this will transform into uh, an inflation that was more persistent because uh, the dislocation and demand for goods will take longer to, to, you know, to go back to uh, the trend line, and also because we are having this uh, new demand for energy. And at the same time that you're having the new demand for energy, you had the lowest capex in energy ever because the world was worried about the green transition, we had less investment in fossil fuel, and for the green transition, the elements that are important for the green transition were going, very, uh, going higher in price uh, at a very fast pace, and it was limiting the, the ability to, uh, to do the transition in a way that you can actually meet the demand for high energy. So when we put all that in the equation, we thought you know, the inflation would be more persistent, and we need to act first. Uh, and we need to act not first, we need to act fast. Uh, and that's more or less one of the reasons. The second reason, which actually diminished the merit of, of actually being, being, being first, was that Brazil is a country that has a very high memory of indexation and inflation. So when we started to see that the world was prepared for a depression, and because of all the effort we were getting, maybe a mild recession, we started to see that you know this is going to affect Brazil more intensively. And you know I, I always say that I always say that the, the central bank can can make two mistakes: one uh, in, a, in a process of fighting inflation, one is you do too much, you go back and you realize you could have done it with less pain to the economy. And if, and if that's the case, uh, you, you made it in an efficient way. Or you could do too little, you could lose expectation, you could lose the inflation anchor, and then to put the country back into uh, uh, a path of, of uh, controlled prices, you need to, in the case of Brazil, the, the case tells us that you actually need to generate a recession. So the, 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 you're always navigating between these two kinds of mistakes. And because Brazil has a high memory of inflation, and we had, uh, uh, the episode of 2014, 15, and 16, in which inflation got out of control and then we had to put the country into a recession to fix the problem. For us, it was very clear that we couldn't take this risk, so we, we needed to, um, to start hiking rates and to start hiking fast. And one other element is that inflation, food inflation in Brazil came first compared to some of the other countries. So we were starting to see uh, food inflation going higher. And we also had a weather problem at the same time you know, like the commissioner was saying that we had many crises at the same time, we had many crises at the same time. One of them was that we had a weather problem, we didn't have rain, our energy is basically hydro, so uh, at the same time we're seeing that we had this weather which was affecting energy and food on the top of the things that were already happening globally. Um, Governor, can I ask you, what do you say to people who think there's a third kind of mistake that central bank governors can make, which is too little and then too much? Both mistakes. And some people worry that that's what's happening, not in Brazil, but they worry about it certainly in the US, they worry about it in Europe. How worried are you about that? I think this statement is actually relating the two, the two kinds of mistakes, because if you do too little, then at some point in time, you don't have a lot of credibility. And when you don't have a lot of credibility, it pushes you to be more likely to do the second mistake, which is do too much. So the fact that you navigate the second kind of mistake with doing too much is because you lost credibility. Um, so I think, you, I think we are seeing some of that in some of the advanced economies. Um, but, but again, it's very difficult to judge from being in Brazil you know, what's happening in most of these advanced economies. I think they have a lot of other variables at play. Um, and you know, for us, what, what, what is important is that now that the advanced economies are fighting inflation, it has a good, a good element for us because you create a disinflation and we, we, we stop. And, and then the, the importing of inflation into Brazil diminishes. So the element of the global inflation diminishes for us. Uh, and Governor, do you think that your analysis of the drivers of inflation, i.e. that they were more demand side and not so much shocks to supply, not so transitory, do you think that's now embedded amongst central bank governors more widely, that that analysis that is the case? 
Yes, I think they are, yes, I, I think um, they are now um, saying the same thing in a different way. Um, uh, and I think it's actually nicer. They're saying it's not that uh, we had a demand shock, it was just that supply was less adaptable, which for me is the same way of saying, <laughs> saying the same thing. But, 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 I mean, it has a good implication because now people are asking themselves, why was supply less adaptable? And this question is very important today because it's going to refer to a lot of the things that Anna mentioned in the initial statement, which is you have a broken, uh, you have a broken uh, you know, global value chain, you have this fragmentation in many different aspects uh, of many economies. And I, and I think for a lot of time, for a long time, because we are very comfortable uh, in some advanced economies printing money without generating inflation, thinking that rates are going to be low for long, I think that, I think, uh, made some of the governments, uh, um, I don't say the lazy is a, is a good word, but made, made the governments com comfortable enough so that we, we went through the longest period without any reform in any of the major economies. And I think we are paying a price for that. So the fact that uh, you, you, you raise this question and the fact that now people are asking, you know, what is the driver behind, I think it's going to, you know, it's going to put us now in front of the real problems maybe we can address. Because at the end, the key is how we're going to grow. Mm -hmm. And the problem is the solution to the crisis is we need to pay uh, for uh, the expenditure that was done in the crisis. And the real, real challenge, I think, and I think it's probably the most important thing that's going to be talked today is how can you pay the bill in an efficient way, right? Because if paying the bill is just raising taxes, and if the paying the bill is just raising taxes on capital, you're going to go to the same things that Anna mentioned, which is you're going to have lower and lower productivity. So the real trick here is you have a bill to pay. Uh, you need to pay in an efficient way. And when I look at what the governments all around are suggesting, is basically increasing taxes and increasing taxes on capital, which will make productivity go lower and lower on the top of the problems that we already have, which is the, the broken uh, value chains, and the demography that is not in our favor, less cooperation in technology, and so on and so forth. I, I want to make sure that we do, e e even though this is not exactly the kind of um, coziest setup for a little chat, I want to make sure we do have a conversation about the proposals and the thoughts that Anna had and that Commissioner Hahn had around government plans and how a government plan can crowd in private investment. And I want to make sure we do really have a conversation about that. But I wanted first, if I could, just to come to you, uh, Dr. Obi, because I suppose you are also dealing with exactly the issues that Anna mentioned and Commissioner Hahn mentioned, which is these big disruptions that have happened, massive dislocations in uh, uh, Western northern economies and the impact on the investment and growth prospectus in Africa. And I just wonder how differently you see things in 2022 than you did even a year ago. I think everybody knows that global shocks. First, thank you so much, my dear friend. <laughs> thank you for inviting me. Um, I think everybody, uh, pretty much anyone who follows uh, growth patterns in Africa would know that global shocks are often so devastating for the economies of Africa. Africa, uh, if you looked at it entirely, is a country of 54, with about uh, 2.9 billion, uh, 2.9 trillion of GDP. Um, the COVID uh, did not have fatalities in terms of health impact, but the impact economically mm. was devastating. And uh, this is for a continent uh, that has a very checkered history with growth and so it's very important for Africa that the world gets its act together. Mm. I love the idea of optimism from my friends, but I prefer the optimism that takes responsibility. And it means that we have to work this optimism into some reality that is important for the poorer regions of the world. If you look at uh, Africa's economic growth rate, at this time, um, it, it's coming from the worst recession that it's, done, it's happened in 25 years to a possible growth of about 3%. <coughs> That's within the region of its population growth. The median age in Africa is 1819. The median age for the world is 30. 
the median age in Europe is 44. The median age in the US is 38. It's a very young continent. So what it means is that when the world thinks of how to jumpstart growth, it cannot do so from an evidence-based policy approach without thinking of Africa. Mm. The opportunities that Africa holds for jumpstarting the kind of growth that we must have toward global prosperity is phenomenal. But because the world processes the idea of risk from a, from a position that's not intelligent, it's an unintelligent way of looking at risk to simply see Africa as the risky region. But, 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 and how do you do that? How do you deal with the knock-on impacts of a strong dollar, higher interest rates, food price inflation, energy inflation, and all the knock-on impacts, as you say, the, the exposure <coughs> in Africa to all of those forces. How do you responsibly deal with that? Well, I mean, it's back to the issue of sound policies. You know, we can't run away from sound policies. Mm -hmm. The problem that we've had around the world is that politics is trumping common sense in terms of an evidence-based approach. That's why I would like to take the central bank governor home to <laughs> give us some really sound monetary policies, because that's what we're dealing with now. We do need people who uh, really understand that, that there is absolutely no economic situation that we're in now that we've not been in before. So we do need to understand how the interaction of monetary and fiscal policies and how even the coherence and coordination, the leadership that the G20, for example, should be showing. Mm -hmm. I mean, this asinine um, great power competition that's holding us into this fragmented world that we're talking about is something that we should all really call out and say, enough of this. Our world needs to grow for the benefit, especially of those that are outside of the privilege that people like me and all of us in this room have had in life. Think of it this way. The, we, the productivity of the world is going to depend on the productivity of the people of the world. Mm -hmm. In my country, in Africa, nine out of every 10 children are not achieving minimum proficiency level in literacy and numeracy. In the whole world, it's seven out of every 10 children. In a world that you and I live in, that's totally unacceptable. The opportunity to actually contribute to economic growth is dependent on the kind of investment we make to ensure that basic foundational literacy and numeracy scale gets our full attention <coughs> because it's tied to economic growth. Uh, Obi, I hope you don't mind. I, I wondered whether you'd tell people <coughs> the story of the conversation that you had. I mentioned you worked at the World Bank when Bob Zelik was the president of the World Bank. <laughs> oh boy, you this James. <laughs> I won't share anything with you again. I, I should have known he's a journalist and I had to be <laughs> careful. <laughs> I did say to him that um, at the time that I was VP in charge of the Africa region program at the World Bank, I said to my boss, I very fondly affectionated to him, uh, Bob Zolik. I said to him, Bob, I have a, a great idea. <laughs> and he said, you've come with your revolutionary thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, this you would like. I said to him, we, you know, we should set a date when we shut the doors of the bank and say goodbye to the world. <laughs> and he said, Bobby, why? I said, because we're not acting with fierce sense of urgency to tackle the problems of poverty. We sit around in our world, and I am afraid, I was telling him at that time, this was about 2010, you know? I said to him that we sit, and I'm, I'm, I, can, I can see that some of my staff may actually be waiting for their grandchildren to come and work at the World Bank. Why should that be so? We should have a fierce sense of urgency and agree that the inequality, the poverty, is unacceptable. In a world where we've seen that the markets can deliver even best solutions to the poor, inclusive growth is possible mm -hmm. through having the right kinds of policies that enable, that facilitate, that empower people to act in the economic freedom, to thrive in enterprise, mm -hmm. in productivity, to be part of global change, like you were saying. I think that the most 
um, in, in significant stain that I see of what you're doing, Anna, is that you're leaving your comfort zone. Mm -hmm. Most banks are not thinking of, you know, a fragmenting world. <laughs> They're just thinking of their little tunnel vision, bottom line profit. Mm -hmm. But you, you are expanding the scope of your, of your focus. And that is something that we need to do more <coughs> in our world today because the problems are for all of us to solve. The multilateral system is not functioning as it should. So we all need to, private sector, public sector, citizens, we need to reclaim those grounds that enable us to find solutions to the most significant problems of our time. So, so could, could we talk about some of those things? Because actually, I thought one of the things that was great about the video was it did, you know, in an unflinching way, tell you, look, here are all the problems we all know. But then there were those snippets of people saying, this is the moment to come together. Yes. Right? And I just wonder whether we can sort of go through some of the ideas, even this morning, that have been raised and ask about how you bring people together. So, Commissioner Hahn, let, let, let's start with, with, with Europe and investment in growth in Europe. And, and I appreciate that, that, that the package, the next generation EU investment, is itself a historic coming together in Europe in terms of investment. I guess the question I've got is, how do you get that scale of public investment to crowd in private investment? And, and what needs to happen either structurally or in terms of supply side reforms so that you enable the private capital to follow in the public? First, I think um, already the discussion so far, the lively debate has uh, proven how important it is to, to overcome this um, hybrid or um, uh, tele, teleconferences because I, I suppose uh, we would never have this kind of dynamic in our discussion. And this is so important because I share your view of urgency. And urgency can only um, not received but answered in a proper way if we are sitting together, if we listen uh, to each other and understand the problems. Because challenges of today are that due to the crisis, we have a tendency uh, to, uh, to, to look uh, only on our issues and not to understand that we are so much interlinked, in particular we, the Europeans. Um, coming to your question, I think um, uh, what we have um, uh, initiated looks a lot of money, but in reality, if you look at uh, the share of the, uh, um, in relation to the GDP, I said it's uh, around 5%, but the importance is it is based on um, country-specific programs, um, um, referring to what we call the um, European semester recommendation. So it's not only uh, about providing money, but also demanding from our member states certain reforms in order to make uh, the different economies more competitive. Mm -hmm. And I think this is something where the private sector, different from one country to the other, has a very strong interest mm. uh, to provide a legal framework which enables them uh, to, to, uh, to operate in a more effective, in a more sustainable, and I agree, more predictable way. What we are doing with these uh, political priorities in terms of green transition, digital transition, is uh, to give quasi guidelines uh, provided or underlined with uh, financial uh, means to go into a certain direction to know what is, by the way, available over a, a predictable time frame, a defined time frame. In the case of next generation EU, it's till 2026. Structural funds is even till the, in reality, till the end of the decade. So if uh, the programs in member states are well designed, I think it gives a lot of indication for the private sector and I'm, I'm pretty sure that uh, the private sector is, is picking up on this. Uh, but again, it depends on the quality of individual programs, no, uh, no doubt. Uh, and, and I just wondered whether, you know, I, I was quite struck by what you said around making sure that we don't meet this set of challenges and crises as if it was the last one. Mm -hmm. And I just wonder what you think banks basically need in terms of the regulatory framework, the, the investment program framework, the supply side reform framework, so that banks can do as much as they can to invest in lifting that growth. 
So, uh, <clears throat> so first, I mean, just I think what we need is, and, and we proved this in Europe during COVID, you know, we need to come together and work in collaboration, not just banks and the financial sector, but governments and I, in more general globally. So again, this is to me is a key point. We need to understand that the problems of today are very different, as I said, of the problems of the past. And this is not just about regulation and, and growth in general, but it's also about society. We're in a digital economy. We have tax laws. We have competition laws that are out of date. They're not fit for purpose. Uh, and until we don't have sound policies, and sound policies, not just fiscal and monetary, is the rules that govern society. And that is what we need as banks to be able to do our job even better. I want to say again that banks have been part of the solution in this crisis, that we are sound. That's the case for Latin American financial systems. Latin American financial systems are sound, as well as the US and Europe. Uh, but as I said, for banks to remain sound, they need to be profitable. And profitability means making more than your cost of capital. You cannot set, just see a big number for profits and say these are extraordinary profits. You need to see those profits in the context of how much capital you put to play. Santander has 100 billion in capital. So if you make 10 billion, it's 10%. Mm -hmm. That is what inflation is today. You make 5 billion, that's 5%. So this is really important. <laughs> so what banks can do is basically help to solve that first urgent problem we have, as Roberto explained, this is about supply and demand. You need to you know, make sure demand is, is sort of restrained. When we raise rates, it's not Santander or the banks, it's the ECB, it's the Bank of Brazil raising rates. We are just doing what they guide us to, okay? But there's another side to the equation, which is supply. And this is my point. So what we need is governments, we need to fund investment. That requires capital. And I gave some numbers um, in my speech uh, as EBF uh, uh, head in Brussels. Just 50 basis points less capital. And again, I'm not saying we, we in any way, you know, uh, go back on the reforms. I'm just saying 50 basis points less capital or more capital available for credit. That's 1.5 trillion more lending in Europe. And that is investment in green transition, that's investment in digital, that's gonna allow us to rebalance and it's gonna allow us to get, so really what we need from governments is that every time they put in place policies, tax increases, uh, any kind of changes, allocation of funds, the, the key question they should ask themselves is, is this gonna help growth? Mm -hmm. Is this going to help growth or not? And to me, that should be the test. James, can yeah. I pick up yeah. what Anna was just saying about um, the investment? Think of, just think of growth corridors, growth poles that we, we, we have neglected, uh, and the opportunities we now have for reigniting growth in those poles. Um, and I think of this in terms of, I, I, I think that, that Europe's issue is not just macroeconomic stability. It really is a competitiveness issue. And the structural reforms that are necessary are the most difficult ones to do because macro is a lot easier. There are not too many vested interests. Yeah. But once you get to micro, then you're gonna to have to come up against vested interests. Now, the kind of political incentives from leaders like yourselves at the EU level, at domestic country level, to really take the bull by the horn is going to be the most important thing that would help us unleash and unlock growth. Mm -hmm. And when you think in terms of the investment, if you say 1.5 trillion, don't think of it as just the Eurozone. Mm -hmm. Your contiguous neighbor is Africa. You shouldn't be quiet on Africa and the opportunities yeah. that abound there. I have said it, that three things are going on for Africa mm -hmm. that are driving the prospects for the continent. The young people, the women, <laughs> and, <laughs> and uh, technology. These three things are game changers for our continent. Mm -hmm. And so when Europe thinks of Africa, it should stop thinking of Africa as a humanitarian case. Mm -hmm. It is a business case. Mm -hmm. And this, the other point I'd like to make is that we've woken up to a world where we now see 
COVID showed us the silliness of allowing a concentration of production system yeah. in one place. In one place. We lost our sense of basic economics, mm -hmm. that diversification of sources of production mm -hmm. would do us better competitively mm -hmm. than what we saw. Mm -hmm. huh? So it is very important for me that in this equation about global growth, that we don't follow the same lens of how we used to look at growth, mm -hmm. but that we should see that the diversification of sources of growth would also help us address what is making capitalism unattractive mm -hmm. to too many people around the world. Commissioner. I'm, I'm very touched that um, all of you um, repeatedly stressing the needs of uh, investment. Why? Because I think we at the political level should also think from the perspective of investments. Mm -hmm. uh, because we Europeans, I have to say, present ourselves always as the biggest donors in the world. But we should be seen as the biggest investors. Indeed. Why? And um, I remember when I started 13 years ago um, as a commissioner for the structural funds, I told my people, <coughs> we are not spending money, providing money, we are investing money. And um, I mean, if you invest in something, you expect a return, not necessarily always in terms of money, but uh, could also be, for instance, if you re invest in education, in training, uh, so say there is uh, so say another kind of return, yes. which is at least so important. But thinking about an investment means to check once, twice, or three times if it is really a um, sustainable, mm -hmm. a feasible investment. Whereas if you provide money, you are probably not so mm. carefully checking uh, the, the intelligence of, of providing money, not to speak investment. So I think also from the political side, w we should much more think in terms of investments. Mm -hmm. But if you take it, because if you take it seriously, you are, have asked yourself, is this an investment which guarantees you a kind of return? And if you're doing so, of course, we should look at Africa yes. from a different perspective than we do, I have to say, in many cases today. Yes. So we have to see this is a business opportunity for us. Mm -hmm. It gives us a long-term um, um, uh, return. And I mean, it's our uh, it's most neighboring. It's a win-win. It's return. a win-win situation for everybody. Uh, and can I just follow up on one thing? I imagine if you, if you are a European politician and you listen to that and you <laughs> witnessed the Biden program, the Inflation Reduction Act, and the prospect of $2 trillion you know, flowing into the US economy, you, you'd, you'd hear, Anna, the prospect of 1.5 billion euros being released into the European economy and be excited by that. Your worry would be, your question would be, what's the mechanism for ensuring that that does go into investment and not just to bank bottom lines? Mm -hmm. And so what is the mechanism that, that European politicians can ensure that happens? Well, um, you know, it, in Europe, uh, every, every conference you go to uh, that's more focused on, on, on the economic side of finance, we always bring up two key, I don't want to undervalue, but it's really important, but it seems like, you know, it's never happening, which is capital markets union and banking union. They're super important to drive growth in Europe, but it's still not happening. Until that happens, I've said it many times, you cannot have a strong Europe without a strong banking system. Right. Strong banking system means that we have to be competitive with the US and with other jurisdictions. And I say this because at the end, banks in Europe provide a large part of the financing to the private sector. And we will not get to the sustainable, inclusive, but at the end of the day, growth we need in Europe without banks playing a function. And we are the ones that know where the productive investments are happening. Simple as that. So, you know, we have the mechanisms because we talk to millions, literally, of SMEs yes. across Europe. So what we offer and have offered for a long time, and actually we have delivered, is partnership with governments to make sure that those that deserve to get investment get it. And by the way, post-COVID, Commissioner, and we said this loud and clear many times, there are many companies in Europe that have taken on too much debt mm. and that the banks cannot, in a prudent way, give them more. 
What they need is equity. What they need is capital yeah. for investment. And they, by the way, they're not competitive, not because they're not competitive in the world, but because they suffered very, very harsh lockdowns. And so to get on that path and not destroy many jobs that then takes much bigger effort, and therefore the rebalancing would take much longer, they need investment now, and this is what the new generation funds can do. And of course, banks can actually help to make that happen. Governor? No, I, 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 um, going back to the issue, I think I remember one day thinking about what we're seeing uh, when we started to see food and energy prices going higher. And I remember kind of drawing a map of what was happening all over because we were having a debate in Brazil whether what to do with, uh, with um, you know, gas and oil prices. And, and we had the issue about Petrobras. And I was looking around and I, I, I got very worried because when I look at uh, food prices going higher, the immediate reaction from some of the governments is I need to make sure that my population, my people have food. So I'm gonna restrict exports on item A, B, C, and we saw that in Asia, in Latin America, and many other places. Um, on the other side, when energy prices was going higher, we saw that the reaction from some of the governments was, let's put, uh, you know, uh, let's put a tax on profit, or let's limit the prices. And the reality is we departed a lot from market practices. And by and large, who produces energy and food? It's not the governments, mm -hmm. it's the companies. Mm -hmm. And so if we depart too much from market prices, what we see is CapEx was going lower. Mm -hmm. So when food prices was going higher, uh, we saw CapEx going lower on most of the industry that process food mm -hmm. because they didn't know whether they would get the, the natural food or not. Mm -hmm. On the other side, oil price was going higher and CapEx on oil was going lower. Mm -hmm. And people will not invest if they think government's gonna tax profit, it's gonna tax this, or if you're gonna have a, a departure from market practice. So I think we need to understand, um, the governments need to understand that we need to work and cooperate. We, can't, we have to move away from fragmentation, but thinking that the solution is moving away from market practice mm -hmm. usually uh, leads to less production uh, in, in a less productive way. C can I just ask you, Governor, there are a couple of things in the short time we've got left that I really do want to sort of think about together. One, one is, the title, as we say, is Growth in a Fragmenting World. For many of us, we feel as though we live in fragmenting countries. Mm -hmm. Within our own countries, mm -hmm. the fragmentation is real. And if you look at the results of the Brazilian election, you would come to that conclusion too, that the, the, the gap within society is wide. Where does that drive governments in terms of their growth agendas? What, what do you likely see in response to that problem? Well, in the case of Brazil, it's very close to 50-50. So obviously, you're gonna have a lot of people that are unhappy. But you know, that's the beauty of the democracy in a way. And now we need to work all together to make sure that we grow and we create jobs and you know, we fight inflation. And I think uh, you know, our job is kind of you know, to make sure that we have an independent central bank that we work with the, with the new government to do that. Um, but I think it's important to understand that the, the polarization also leads to some policies that sometimes are not the optimal ones because sometimes you are trying to address that group that is very polarized. And some of the measures, and it's not only Brazil, it's globally, some of the measures that are being taken are not measures that are going to induce productivity. And the biggest fragmentation problem that we have right now is if you look at capital and labor, when you look at productivity, you imagine capital and labor. Labor, we have a big problem. The, war, the population is decelerating. Our biggest problem today is that population growth is going lower and lower. But 95% of the growth in population is in sub-Saharan Africa. So we have people on one side, but these people need capital. And we have a, also a very big fragmentation in capital because right now, if you look at the semiconductor industry, that could be a disaster waiting to happen because you have some uh, semiconductors that are produced in the US that are needed for uh, people in other places to produce other things. And the technology, the, the cooperation technology is, you know, is, is, broken, is breaking down. So again, I think it's about uh, what the polarization will generate in terms of the policies. Hmm. Well, the, the one other thought that I did want to make sure we just touch on before we finish, and I know we're running out of time, but Commissioner Hahn, you've talked about the idea of strategic autonomy 
And it would be foolish to have a conversation about a fragmenting world without acknowledging that actually there are some serious choices we make in that fragmenting world that <coughs> may mean something different from a generation of globalization. And I just wondered whether you could explain what strategic autonomy means and what you think the implications of that are. In one minute. In one minute, exactly. It There's a big red sign here that says time's up. It still doesn't asking. mean yeah. to do everything in Europe. But in reality, to, to use the fragmented world to diversify our supply sources, but also to diversify our customers, not to do everything in Europe, but to do it in different parts of the world, to have more partnership relations. And I think this is what we understand as a strategic sovereignty. It means that uh, we can rely much more on our opportunities and um, uh, become less vulnerable. And I think this is the lesson we have learned in the past three years. And I think this is one of the lasting uh, effects from the, from the, from the recent uh, crisis. All right, Obi and Anna, I'm give you the last words. We, we've said that this session is about the key drivers of growth. You mentioned the young population of Africa. In what sense do you look at that as an opportunity? It is an opportunity because an aging Europe is going to need productivity to sustain itself. And that productivity is guaranteed you if you would but only look at Africa as strategic partners, not just rhetorically. We've had enough of the rhetoric <laughs> of politicians saying Africa is a partner. No, we don't want statements. We want action. Just do it. <laughs> Let there be a sitting together <coughs> of Europe and Africa identifying the humongous opportunities. I think it's enough for Europe to look at Africa purely from immigration policy. That's like the tail wagging the dog. <laughs> for goodness sake, there's so much more that is possible. Already, our young people are finding themselves project teams between young Africans, young Europeans. The women are finding themselves, we found ourselves, you know. And so all of these person to person, the role of government is actually to enable, to facilitate, and to do so on the basis of what works and to avoid silly policies that don't work just because they are politically expedient. And, and they sound good. Obi, thank you. All right, Anna, the final thought. In this complicated and messy world, what do you think are the opportunities for growth? My point is very simple. Governments and private sector, we all of us need to understand that growth and resilience, growth and inclusion go hand in hand. Yes. And that is the best way to get economic, political, social, you know, resilience is by promoting growth. Ladies and gentlemen, please give a round of applause. Roberto Campos, Anna Bottin, Olga Sosuele, and Anna Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thanks so much. Thanks.